Hello and welcome to the Insight is Capital podcast. I'm Pierre Daly, Managing Editor of AdvisorAnalyst.com. Our COO, Joseph Lamana, is here as well. Well, uh, our extremely special guest today is the one and only Hugh Hendry, also known as the Acid Capitalist, infamous founder of Eclectica Asset Management, the award-winning hedge fund manager, market commentator, and in my humble opinion, a thought leader of towering intellect during the last 20 years, pre and post the GFC meltdown and since. Hugh figures very large in the life of advisoranalyst.com as we were actively sharing Hugh's points of view, outlook, and TV interviews. We couldn't get enough of it during the post-2008 period. And when everyone was scrambling for answers to what in the hell was going on, there was Hugh Hendry cutting through all the noise, sharing his profoundly well-informed and well-investigated perspective of markets and what he saw was actually going on. This is the Insight is Capital podcast. The views and opinions expressed in this broadcast are those of the individual guests and do not necessarily reflect the official policy or position of AdvisorAnalyst.com or of our guests. This broadcast is meant to be for informational purposes only. Nothing discussed in this broadcast is intended to be considered as advice. So Hugh, first of all, to say I'm extremely excited to be chatting with you would be a great understatement. It's an honor and a privilege. Thank you so much for joining us today on Insight is Capital. Well, I'm, what can I say? What an introduction. I am, I am humbled uh, beyond belief, <laughs> uh, but I'll take it, you know, <laughs> what the heck, I'll take it. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, and for those perhaps uh, less, less familiar, you know, it, it, but it, it comes with a sticker warn, warning, you know, that um, I want to say that there have been moments where when I really focused and concentrated, um, I was able to to gain, albeit a brief, but gain a, an insight into events that, that might just happen, if you will. But in order to exercise that, that power of foresight, you know, I, I live a life separate, a, a life which is in conflict with the conventions that we associate with money managers and, and commentators. And so please don't be mistaken or put off by my, my clownish uh, endeavor. I do everything to, to, to push people away. It's, it's, you know, I'm a, I'm a shaman. Um, and it's not everyone's cup of tea, but sometimes just sometimes. Uh, it pays to listen to the crazy guys. <laughs> and listen, listen, we do. Um, Hugh, for all those who don't know you, uh, please tell us about your beginnings, how you got into the business of investing, the arc of your career, and last but not least, what you're up to now. Why? Um, yeah, um, I, I'm actually uh, plugged, but I, I'm, I'm planning on releasing a, I'm planning on releasing it, uh, the asset capitalist book, which is, is that kind of point A, point B story from, from a, you know, a, a vicious, um, uh, housing project in the outskirts of, of Glasgow in Scotland, um, to here, to now living in this beautiful tropical billionaire paradise that we call St. Bart's. Um, and, and boy, yeah, that, that's a story. And, and it's a story of inversion. It's a story of, um, of a 10 year old kid smarter and wiser than he, way wiser than his age, um, believing that he'd either been held kidnapped, um, or had been orphaned, um, <laughs> but, but certainly didn't, didn't belong, um, under the, the gray vistas. You know, I looked out of my, my bedroom window and window and life was gray, but I, I didn't, I didn't have a longing to stay, stay there, but I had the wisdom to recognize that education perhaps would be my ticket to leave, which was the imperative. And I have to say, I, I just worked, worked, worked damn hard. I have to say at the other end of that tunnel, I am, I'm Benjamin Button. I'm <laughs> determined that every day I'm getting younger. I, and I, and I, I go to absurd lengths. You know, I'm one of these freaks. I, I take all four, I pop all forms of pills and supplements. I don't eat for about 22 hours a day. I get high. I mean, <laughs> I get high 
I get high on my, my own, uh, on, on my own internal combustion. When you haven't eaten for 20 hours uh, and you're feeding on, you're burning fat, um, you get, you see stuff. Not all of it makes sense, but you see stuff. Okay. So that's where I am now. I'm, I'm getting younger every day. You'll find me on Instagram getting younger every day in an absurd manner. <laughs> um, one of the kind of, let's kind of try and not get log jammed there, but one of the, the, the key things that happened to me, I found I, in Scotland, you can do a fourth year, it's a, a, an honors year is called in the graduate undergraduate program. And I found myself doing a, a, a course called financial based counting research. Um, I mean, which then I, now I've got, I've got to tell you all my secrets. I've got to tell you that, um, I, you know, Hey, my father was a truck driver, you know, beep, beep to the, to the guys on the streets. But, um, yeah. Um, so if your father's a, a truck driver, my mother was a receptionist, you know, initially your sets gets, you, you set your sights on being like an accountant or a lawyer. So I, I studied accountancy. Um, which I count to see in economics, but this final year was revelatory because with this market-based accounting research, I got introduced to my first portal, uh, to data stream, data stream being a, a, a pre pre runner to now the glorious Bloomberg glorious, right. but hideously expensive, uh, Bloomberg. And, and what I was, I, I was testing these theses, you know, like, um, does the market have wisdom? If you announce uh, an accounting policy and it, and, it, and it reduces earnings, so it perhaps accelerates a depreciation policy, but of course it has no impact on, on cash flows and therefore logically the share price, it should have no bearing on the share price, the valuation of the company. And so we set up these null hypothesis things and then we had market data and it was like the genie was revealing itself. I've always been something something voyeuristic, you know, I, I, uh, I spent too long what, and, and indeed I'd made a career out of watching other people. Okay. And this was, so this suddenly was my passion. This was the thing that clicked. I am not, you know, the boy savant. I am not the boy entrepreneur. Um, in the, I am a child of, of, of the Thatcher revolution, you know, my yeah. working class parents were liberated by the ability to buy public housing stock. Um, and of course we then had privatizations of, of, uh, of utilities and, you know, we, we transferred ownership from the public sector to, to the private. And back then you, the, the marketing campaign for the gas, uh, the, the IPO of the, the gas company, British gas was, Hey, have you seen Sid now? Back when I was a teenager, the only Sid that I was looking for was Sid Vicious. It certainly was not <laughs> Sid from British Gas. Okay, so uh, I don't come from the background that is typical of the leaders on Wall Street. And, and I, I made a career. Uh, I worked 10 years or so in an outstandingly rigorous pension fund management group in Edinburgh, uh, going nowhere just not, not succeeding. Um, I was, uh, transformed by a chance meeting with, uh, one of the first hedge fund managers in Europe, Chris Benodi. Yeah. And, and I subsequently joined and became a partner with him for, uh, six years. And then I set up the Eclectica macro fund, uh, within the auspices of, of Crispin's organization. And then since 2005, well, I, I, I parted company. Um, I ran that fund. I'm very proud to say performance is performance. I mean, you know, making money is a preposterous activity. You know, this, this charade, this, this fraud that we can see the future. Um, I, <laughs> I offered, I offered you an insurance contract and when bad things happened, I tended to make a lot of money. When bad things did happen, I didn't really make any money. And when you put that all into the melting pot, I kind of protected you, protected 
protected you during adversity and I paid you 8% per annum in terms of my total return for 15 years. So um, most hedge funds don't persist. I persisted for 15 years. At the end, I had become joy passionate but joyless. Uh, the role of macro had been supplanted by perhaps quantitative easing by a different form right. of central banking. And that, I say that without prejudice. Um, and I should have walked away in 2013. I lacked the guts, I have to say, if I'm honest. And, and it took the clients like four years later, like, oh, well, maybe we should leave. There doesn't seem to be anyone <laughs> in the shop, we, you know? Um, and so uh, for the, since 2017 or, or slightly before, I have been on this private island, a uh, private, I've been on this wonderful island of St. Bart's. Um, I've been making great investments in, in property here. Um, so I, I now have investments where I get to live in them. So it's a bit like the, um, the Truman show, you know, yeah. uh, and yeah. I don't know if the joke's on me or if the joke's on everyone else. I'm not sure. Um, but again, in Benjamin Button land here, here, I'm just 10 years younger and and, and certainly there was, there was that, there was the tyranny of shame. Shame is the most, uh, preposterously bad sentiment that can befall you. It's a, it's a, it's harmful and it's, uh, it's not productive, but there was a kind of, you, you wrap your identity around your commerce, your business. And so when it ended, there was a kind of shame, if you will, um, but I've recycled that. I, I feel much better. Well, and, and now I'm, I'm here. I'm here with you. You know, you know what, what Hugh, you, you were, you were, I, I recall you were famously quoted as, as saying, I cannot look at myself in the mirror. Everything I have believed in, I've had to reject. And I, I'm just, you know, going back a step because you did mention that, that, you know, when, when you, when you decided to, uh, um, fold up Eclectica, what were you feeling? at the time that you said that, I mean, I, I know you said it had something to do with quantitative easing. Uh, I mean, I know that, that, that it had something to do with how quantitative easing was, was warping or distorting the market. But, but is that, is that, am I correct in that? Uh, yes, no. <laughs> uh, okay. <laughs> which is a bit like being in my, my first visit to Reykjavik. Um, and I asked the taxi driver at the airport, can you, can, can you take me to town? And he said, no. <laughs> I was like, oh, I, I, I don't understand. Um, anyway, so, uh, <laughs> several things I, I want to say to that. So in, in, in Icelandic, they, they have kind of, I don't know if it's true, but I think yes means no, no means yes. Uh, I, I famously, um, or otherwise, but I was, I had, I had the biggest short position on the cod currency. Um, would you believe I was the equivalent of 2% of GDP short? <laughs> <laughs> the Icelandic Krona, <laughs> I, I, because, because of that uh, experience at the airport, I'm like, oh, so yes means no. The biggest <laughs> bank's called a uh, Kaup thing and Kaup is a German verb to buy. And so the inverse of buy is sell. And so I thought, well, let's sell <laughs> the land of lava. Um, but, uh, so first of all, I, I want to say three things. I want to say that, um, I believe one of my superpowers was dexterity or the, or a plasticine mind where to succeed in risk, risk management. I had to excel in the ability to absolutely reject passionately everything that I told you the day before. Um, but one, yeah. uh, I was, I featured in a, in a, in a book. Um, and I was described as the plasticine macro trader. I mean, I, I set my, I set my risk portfolio up, uh, in terms of it, it was many, many, many iterations. And I, and so I could cut things off. And so, um, I was very much against, there was the, around about 2012, 2013, as yep. hedge fund returns started to kind of, uh, be affected by the quantum of money in the sector. Um. I, what am I saying? The, the returns and my 
client. Yes, the, the client started to say, hey, listen, we want you to do focused best fund, best fund ideas. I was like, you know, we want like two or three positions. I didn't do that because that takes away from the plasticity. It, it, it creates rigidity because how can you, re it's like, you know, the movie with, where the guy, the, he's climbing and he has to cut his arm off to, to survive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you, you've only, it's your best ideas. This, this is, where's my hat, man? This is a great idea. And this is a great idea. <laughs> so it's my, I can't lose them. Yeah, I'm going to, I die. And, and I've seen risk managers die rather than chop off an idea. So, so that point. Secondly, the, I, I could never bear looking in mirrors. Um, the camera's bad enough. But the, the mirror that I had, so the, the, something that was very prominent and, and you, it just, it flared as you said it, but that, it, you know, that the fairy tale mirror, mirror on the wall, who's the smartest of them all, <laughs> right? In my mirror, I, I became a crack addict for the score, for the score, you know, uh, we had sp spreadsheets up on every digital spreadsheets up on every wall in the office. And, and of course, the thing that any young analyst working at a hedge fund, working late at night and the phone rings and you're the old one and you pick it up and it's the boss and he's just landed. He's been crossing, he's been London to Tokyo. He's been out of action for 12 hours. He's like, what's the score? And you're like, oh, no. Yeah. You know, and so, and, and of course, uh, information is a function of uh, signal and, and the signal distorts. The, the more observations, if you will, you get on that. So I was picking up too many idiot, 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 genius, idiot, idiot kind of scores. Cause I asked too much. Um, uh, and then finally, I want to say that I, um, I, I experienced a Damascian, uh, change in how I, um, uh, perceive quantitative easing. I, I actually, I lost two years. I lost two reputational years, very damaging um, in terms of opportunity cost, in terms of what I could have, what I should have done. In the aftermath of 2008, I became kind of a pugnacious moralizer. You know, I wanted us to purge the system. I mean, I remember from, from about April 2007, I had become an insider. There was perhaps no more than a hundred people in the world that had come to understand that the world, the financial world was going to come to an end. Like the sun in our sky was going to blow, was going to explode, that we were dead. Yeah. And, you know, and I was, I spent all my time scurrying to find my, you know, my my Charlie Wonker, my, my golden, uh, <laughs> my golden, golden ticket. ticket. Yeah. <laughs> Not to go to the factory, but to get on a spaceship and get the heck out of it, you know? So, <laughs> and, and so forewarned the, the stuff that went down, you know, the right at the end, the ban on short selling of financial stocks in September, yeah. the fact that Wells Fargo, I mean, there is no sane reason why Wells Fargo survived. And let's say Washington Mutual failed. I mean, to, to the outsider, if you were to take the name off and then just present their, their deck in terms of geographical yep. split, product split, they were identical. And yet the months of Lehman's, uh, disappearing, Wells Fargo made its all time high. I mean, just insane. So I, I had a rage, but you know, I was engaged and employed to be a risk manager and not a moralizer. And so I finally accepted that central banks, remember Bernanke famously apologized on behalf of his institution on the 90th or 91st birthday of Milton Friedman. And he said, you know, the great depression is on us. We got it wrong. We hear you. And we will make other mistakes, but we won't make that mistake. And, and so I have to say that quantitative easing, um, has its flaws, but I think 
that pivot in policy making was essential in preventing a Great Depression 2.0. Absolutely. Those were, uh, those were scary times. I think when you, you know, when you find out after the fact that, that, you know, um, the Fed, the Fed was hours away from, from insolvency or that the banking system was hours away from insolvency, that they were literally out of cash. Um, you know, that revelation sort of def definitely validates the, the fear that was happening at the time. Um, so Hugh, on a, let, let's change gears a little bit. <laughs> um, what are you, thank you very much for sharing that, by the way, that was, uh, you, you know, I think, I think you're well known by now for beating yourself up and, and for, uh, you know, for talking openly about your mistakes, which is admirable, uh, at, at, le at the very least, it's a very admirable quality that you have, uh, and your humility about, about, um, your, your successes and your failures is, is also, uh, a, a wonderful character trait that, that we've come to love, um. Mm -hmm. What is it you're most excited about right now? What, and, and at the same time, the corollary is what are you most disappointed about right now? What's moving the needle for you? Wow. Um, you, you know, life is becoming so exciting. I, again, I think it's just this being high all the time, but I am, I'm, I don't know, I'm tapping into, I don't know what I'm tapping into, but you know, someone is broadcasting brain signals to me in St. Bart's because uh, for the longest time, opportunities seemed like a golf ball and kind of like trying to hit it uh, was, you know, was 50-50, whereas now that the ball is enormous, it's just giant. Um, so the, where can I take you? Where can I take So a lot of conjecture here, um, but the, it feels like it feels like the 40 year bull market in treasuries is climaxing. Okay. Um, it feels like it. there's still an immense amount of intellectual hard work necessary to actually explain or rationalize why that is, or could be the case. But let's use that hypothesis, let's say that it is, and maybe later I can offer some intellectual justification for that. If it is, then again, the nature of how I approach risk is that you should expect yields to go back to the lows, if not to go lower. Paradoxical think, you know, so in January, 2006, I wrote to my clients saying that if, if you believe your city group had just published all the wall street banks, having never wanted to touch gold rightly. So for the, the 25 years or so that it spent, you know, being, you know, destroyed on an opportunity cost, you know, I think the S and P rose 10 times and, and gold lost two thirds of its value every while, uh, but. In late 2005, Citigroup came out with a $3,000 price target and gold back then would have been trading probably $700. Um, I'd been buying it at 260 in 2003. I'd been buying it as the UK treasury was, was selling it. But then I, I was saying to people, Hey, listen, if you think the future is inflationary, um, then you've got to buy 10 or 30 year us treasuries. And people are like, huh, what? <laughs> like, yeah. And the rationale there was <laughs> that, um, you know, to get to that 3000 price target, you would have to generate a revolution, another revolution in the thinking and modus operandi of central banks. You'd have to make them profound risk takers, if you will. And they would only get there because they would be the, the challenge they'd be being overwhelmed by uh, other fears of, of, you know, so give us a depressionary, a deflationary, huge deflationary event, interest rates will go to, go to zero. This is what I'm writing in 2006 and, and there'll be a revolution. We'll get quantitative easing. And then ultimately you might get to that 3000 level. And, and so, and if you will, 
a lot of that came to pass. Two years later, Lehman Brothers, et cetera, um, the Fed, the Fed went to zero, bonds went to all time highs, and now gold's kind of moving back to 2000 again. But with regard to climaxes, so the treasury bull market is the greatest bull market ever because, because of its risk less nature, right? So the, and the advent, you know, so Ray Dalio, is Ray Dalio a genius? Maybe. Uh, he's certainly responsible for cumulatively the greatest bounty of P&L ever generated for clients, which is $55 billion. Again, genius or context? I would say maybe, a, let's be generous, a bit of both, obviously, a bit of both. Uh, but context, he's running a permanent portfolio, which is using a volatility uh, allocator between the quadrants. And one quadrant right. has you know, duration treasury, one quadrant has cash treasury, cash bills, okay? And, and cash bills yields fall like from the highs to zero. Um, and, and for the 10 year, the yield falls from 16 again to almost zero. And the volatility is up until about five, six years ago, you know, treasury volatility was always like, um, uh, 40% less than equities. And so your allocation was always bigger and bigger. Right? So that's, that's how you make $55 billion. But again, I'm, I'm not getting to the point. Uh, it's Michael Steinhardt. Michael Steinhardt was buying treasuries, um, uh, in 1982 when, when he was climaxed and he right. was sued by his clients. And I was like, well, what are you doing? <laughs> like stick to equities. You're really good on the commodities and gold. Like, but you know, since you, since you did this style drift into, into a uh, fixed income, you're just printing losses, you know? So we're suing you for style drift. You're, you're beyond your mandate. Uh, Yields hit 16 with, with unambiguous data pointing to lower inflation. And what I want to say to you is yields will hit new lows with unmistakable evidence of inflation. So I think what, where we are, and I think, I don't think many people would disagree that landmark move in treasury bills marked a return of order and, and sanity, if you will, into society. The 1970s was crazy, was cuckoo land. Yeah. I mean, you had the OPEC embargo two times, the Russians invading Afghanistan. You had the Iranians having the audacity to, to, to take down the U S embassy. And then you had the, I mean, it, it beggars belief, but the U S didn't do anything about it. They went, you know, the, the Iranians thought we we're going to get our asses kicked. And the U.S. went, mm, can, can we please have them back? <laughs> wow. Uh, so it was the you had chaos and yep. anarchy. But at the end, you had the restoration of order, which was reflected in equity and, and other risk assets being in this multi-decade uh, bull market. That feels like it is climaxing. And it feels like, like we were saying off camera, that the amplification of social mood with, um, with these platforms, it, like the world has become binary and angry and we're not making logical decisions. I'm, I'm very yep. passionate, but also I despair with the notion of saving the planet. And, and so before I go, so I, I'm, I'm putting into my mix that I am, I am mindful of the notion that there's a trade for treasuries. Uh, to trade back at price highs. Um, I'm mindful that euro dollar contracts, which are pricing in 2%, and yet the private free intelligent market is saying to the Fed, we don't see what you're seeing, which is to say you've had profound flattening in the curve. Right. And so the, again, the optionality convexity that you can get if you get your timing right on a, on what it, a 99 and 99.5 strike Euro dollar contract for, uh, December this year, March next year, you know, let's, let's be preposterous, but let's price it up and let's examine that. Okay. So trades, I'm now moving into this social mood. I'm saying to you that I, I really like 
the carbon permit market in Europe. Like we have done, we've done many good things. You, know, we've, we've, we brought, we like our American overseers, I think have been a, a benevolent empire that having encouraged, uh, competitive systems, uh, to become richer. We've an America, we America has, has empowered that, uh, we allowed China to enter the WTO system despite being run by fascists. Um, so far we've tolerated Vlad. I am up to here with Vlad, the <laughs> blunderer. I'm spending a lot of time just now on Twitter with my campaign. If, if the, the dictator can build a 1200 kilometer pipe to ship gas into <laughs> Europe, why can't forget liquid, liquid LNG is preposterous. When you liquefy gas, you're turning gas into the carbon equivalent of coal, right? Gas, when you burn yeah. gas is half the, the carbon emissions as coal. That's why we need gas emissions. Okay. But the problem with natural gas presently is a local market. It's not a global market. Okay. The local market gas trades for $4 50 in Europe with Vlad gas is trading at a hundred bucks in Asia. Somehow they, they can, they can survive paying 200 bucks via LNG. <laughs> I mean, so let's, let's forget liquid gas. Let's build, let's produce Liberty gas. Let's get a 3,600 kilometer pipeline from Newfoundland to Ireland and let's ship over all of that. There's an infinite supply of Liberty gas on the American continent and add a stroke. Yep. At a stroke, you cut off the balls of dictators like, like Vladimir. And then what, what happens? Imagine the, the thing that Europe lacks is an independent energy source. It's dependent on, on Russia and they don't have our democracy. If just by changing that, the Europe could become phenomenal. It's chained, it's held, held back. Yeah. So I'm saying to the world's, you know, this, this benevolent overseer with all of this gas, let's build a pipe because you know, so someone might say, Hey, that could cost the, the pipeline for Nord Stream was 10 billion. Um, and, and of course with the Ukrainian thing, NATO say, Hey, look, we're going to like Trump there say, Hey, maybe, maybe that preposterous guy was kind of right. Maybe we got to <laughs> spend a bit more. Well, I looked at total NATO spending is it's one point. 1.2 trillion. Are they going to increase at five? Maybe probably more like 10. Well, rather than spending 120 billion yeah. on, on weapons, build a damn pipe, you know, anyway. So I'm curious about natural gas, um, carbon yeah. emissions, carbon permitting is too cheap. Um, carbon permits. We have to carbon permits. The politicians in Europe, I don't say this often have, cr have created a wonderful market based price discovery system that should be copied and should be, uh, applauded and, and celebrated, but uh, transplanted across the world. Um, and, and so, you know, us as naked, and especially me, I'm a naked capitalist, uh, the, um, <laughs> we get a bad nail. You just, they, you know, young people, they don't, they don't want to be us. And I'm like, guys, listen, what if I said to you, we could make money and we can save the planet. You know, the idea that you go and you chain yourself to a fence and the idea <laughs> that you say no more, or if we have this, uh, rebellion, extinct, extinction, rebellion, um, environmental, uh, anger is, is good, but anger with this form of, I call it Dada, Dadaism, you know, this kind of just the, the, the insanity that you get around fan de seek the end of centuries. Um, it's, you know, it, it's like saying the, the number one global issue is, uh, we're unhealthy and, and the number one objective is to, to cure cancer. Okay. And, and what do we decide? We decide to abolish pharmaceutical companies. That's where we are just now in terms of the carbon and, and the global warming story. We need smart decisions. You know, the, in, in Nor the average barrel of oil is 
responsible for about 60 kilograms of carbon. Okay. Um, and, and a lot of that comes from its exploration, but also the burning of the oil. Norway today with large oil, the intellect, the expertise of large oil is pulling out new barrels of oil with one kilogram, one kilogram of carbon, right? That's what we need. Anyway, so I like. Hey, by the way, by the way, I, I want, and then, and then I'll let you continue, but I, I wanted to, uh, uh, bring up the fact that, that, you know, I, I, it's, it's, it's great how you, you refer to, uh, you know, the great dictator Vladimir, uh, by the French pronunciation of his last name. Yes. <laughs> it, it, it's right. P Putain. No surprise that it, in French, it is a gros mot. For sure, it is yeah. a gros mot. Um, <laughs> and I, I, I'm involved in a lot of, I'm surrounded by, I'm in a construction site uh, with French and Portuguese builders. And believe me, I yeah. use that gros mot often uh, in my intercourse <laughs> with, with this project. Um, it's, a, it's a bit like, you, and again, this is how my mind worked. <clears throat> um, the first French president of the ECB. Trichet. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And, and Trichet is the French <laughs> yeah, verb. That's beautiful. Is the French verb. It's a what? To cheat. To cheat. Yeah. And cheating. Guy, yeah. Guy, was a, <laughs> guy was a blinking idiot. So yes, um, a nomen is a nomen. Believe me, it, during the, yeah. the, the rise in, in NASDAQ um, in, in the late 1990s, I mean, I remember shorting a Swiss stock because, uh, you know, a tech stock because it was called Miracle. And the only miracle was this valuation and its presence yeah. on the stock market. You know, but that was, uh, I, I use a lot of men. Hugh, for, 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 forgive me if I'm wrong, but it's, it's, uh, it's Christine Lagarde now, right? Yes. Yeah, yeah. So, so does the same thing apply for Christine Lagarde? Lagarde? <laughs> what? Oh, forgive me. The, the, by, the guard? Uh, Oh, the gar, <laughs> maybe. Um, yeah. Um, anyway, <laughs> the, um, I don't know what to make of Christine actually. Um, yeah. but anyway, so yeah. Um, and so Sorry, we done, you know oh, what yeah. you, I, 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 you know, I'm, I'm, I think we're, we're very interested in hearing about, uh, your thoughts on, <laughs> on natural gas. I know, <laughs> you know, you, you've been talking about how, how, you know, about this natural gas trade and no one wants to go along with you on it. Well, I don't have a trade. Right, no one's... I don't. I don't have a well, trade. Um, yeah. I, I. I. Not the trade, but the 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 sentiment, the action. Yes, that's true. It, yeah. So it was funny. I I put a thread out, and and so I'm back. Yeah, I'm back almost. I'm back. I'm definitely back. And so, <laughs> in my former life, I would be alone. You know, I, I would sit at home, I'd listen to music and I'd read abstract things, you know, my, my wife's Vogue mm -hmm. magazine, you know, um, but I, you know, um, how you excel in something, Roger Federer, that level of skill set. Um, there is a, a saying that you have to do something 10,000 times yeah. to That's, be really good. Yeah. So I've been yes. in the Caribbean since 2015, so coming on seven years, and I've started surfing. Um, and I think I've done it now 2,379 times, which is say less than 10,000. Um, and, um, I'm not, but how I'm, many I, hours? I, I, <laughs> yeah, I, I'm, 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 I'm competent, but I'm. So the, the French word, put down, uh, the, um, <laughs> so I, I'm competent, but I, I'm not excelling. Yeah. I'm not excelling. I, I, okay. Um, that's all right. I, Go. <laughs> I don't, I don't think, no first, I don't think I've had sex. I know for sure I've not had sex for 10,000 times. So for sure I'm not excelling <laughs> there either. Um, but I have looked at, I have looked at way more than 10,000 charts. And, yeah. and I wanted, I am a, I'm a horse whisperer. I mean, charts, patterns, formations, and, and you marry that with experience, the amount, 
the times, how I called upon them, how I've seen them react. That is my tapestry. That is my engagement for understanding things. Um, you know, like oil, oil had been capped at 40 yep. bucks for 15, 17 years. And it was 2004 when, 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 when we lifted. I mean, that, that's, that's just classic sign. I mean, it's just classic. I mean, that sign repeats long, long, long plateaus of, of price highs reveal that uh, to the external world, there is not enough information content available to justify higher prices. The fact that that does happen reveals that information has just been released into the, the universe. And then I was fortunate that I would have an Intel team and I could, and they would be charged with finding out and, and retrieving that information. So natural gas, um, I, I do these weekly podcasts and we've been recently Which talking. Are amazing. So thank you. I mean, they're, you know, they're yep. erratic. <clears throat> um, this, and this, no, they're awesome. <laughs> and, and your natural gas. And I was looking at, yep. would you believe, I think in March, April, 2006, I, 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 I mean, I did everything, uh, everything. I, and so no surprise that I've, I've forgotten about this, but I was playing calendar spreads and natural gas the year of Amaran, you know, the September when, yeah. when the, that kid, what was his name? Do you know, do you remember? Uh, you're talking about the, uh, the Amaran, no, sorry, Amar Amaran CIO. Remember, so they had nine and a half billion. They were multi-strat, but they secretly really liked natural gas. And, um, and on the 18th of September, the, he, he had to go, oof, oops, uh, got to tell you, <laughs> trading's been tough and we've just dropped five yeah. yards. We just, we've vaporized half of the fund. Sorry about that. And of course, <laughs> blood in the water in the, the hour after that's released, the, the hour of trading, the first hour of trading the next day, they vaporize another half a billion as Wall Street comes in going, you know, ding, 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 ding. You know, yeah. it was finally resolved by, you know, uh, we, we talk about these titans of Wall Street that hedge funds yeah. don't exist anymore. You know, hedge funds to me were, were George. Soros and, and, and gang in the seventies, you know, a uh, contentious narrative seeking, seeking an audience, you know, a, a white canvas, um, like setting out a view of the future and seeking wealthy patrons to sponsor that view. Um, that's gone. Hedge ones today are the system, right? And so. Yeah. And, and the greatest of all of them is Ken, Ken Griffiths, Citadel, right? Because he is, he's the system. He's probably worth, that thing's probably yeah. worth more than Credit Suisse, given their incompetence, right? Um, and so no surprise when Amaranth disappeared, he takes, so it's already vaporized 75% of his value. And he's like, well, I'll take it off you at a, at a 2 billion discount. I mean, that's what the system <laughs> does. Money rewards the yeah. system. Anyway, so it was kind of funny. I'm like, oof, what? Really? I why was, why was I doing calendar sp uh, spread trades? So calendar spread trades, um, I, I was emphatic that the 2011, so I was writing in 2006, I was emphatic that the five year forward price was too low. Um, um, right. And what had happened after oil had taken out $40 was that the, the shape in the nat gas curve changed. It had almost permanently been in contango. And it moved into backwardation. And again, remember all of you, you folk, they, they get suckered into buying VIX contracts that you, know, the, the abhorrent danger of a uh, curve switch trade in contango, uh, gas in the 12 years from 1994 to 2006 rose from a dollar to six bucks. But if you were a pension fund, hopefully not a smart, wise Canadian pension scheme or whatever. But if you no. were long the front month and just ran the front month, you lost 80%. Market goes up six hold, but contango yep. and the price of rolling, you lost 80%. So I was very intrigued by the backwardation um, and the cheapness of nat gas. But of course, the, the answer was the, the shale oil revolution. Uh, and so where again, I, 
Yeah, what, I, do you, the, what do you make of the uh, what do you make of of, of the, the oil futures being broken in 2020? I wish they was broken in 2020. I mean, you know, the, yeah. the, the, the Fed's ability to make a market in treasuries was, you know, briefly, briefly broken. Um, you know, we're, we're, we had a, I'll say it again, we had a, uh, an alien body invasion, um, which was clearly unprecedented and, and, and therefore everything was on the table. Um, but briefly, and maybe the other thing was it lasted a little bit longer. Um, but, and so I, maybe I, I, so I want to be as ridiculous as, as then I want to say to you, so a, a revelation I received of late is, you know, there are many billions of us on this planet. I want to say something like 6.7 billion of us consume on average 13 barrels of oil. That's 13 times 60 kilograms of CO2. Um, and then there's 6. 6.3 billion poorer folk and they consume three barrels because they're poor. And if we go 25 years out to that kind of 2050, one of those dates for, you know, trying to bring, bring, yep. bring, bring order, um, those kind of poor folk for sure, they're, they're going to consume more, more oil. Say they consume one extra bottle of oil, right? And let's say we get our act together and we don't consume any more. We just, we just stick at 13. Um, we're going to double carbon emissions between now and then, which is to say, and then remember, so that's the demand function. That's the demand function. The supply function with the zealotry and the um, absolute zero oil expansion nonsense. Okay. Oil's, oil's not going to 100. Oil's going to 150, 200, 250, 300. Yeah, it's preposterous. Um, and, and again, we have to find solutions. And one of the, one of the solutions is we're, we got to wake up. We got to wake up in the sense that, so the shale gas, the shale discovery, effectively, they don't say this in the stats, but the stats are always nonsense. The stats say that the US has the world's fourth largest uh, natural gas reserve in the world. The, I'm going to tell you, the U S has an infinite supply of gas. Okay. But the problem with gas <laughs> is it trades locally and not, not, uh, globally, uh, because of how you distribute it. Um, so, you know, there's, yeah, the, the problem is we, I don't like trades where you, you need politics. I like trades where politics are pushing in your direction. So like the carbon yeah. permits, but not, not gas is, is effectively dead until politicians wake up and say, Hey, listen, rather than spending 10% more on defense spending for NATO because of Vlad, why not you, we put a man on the moon yeah, and that, and gas is hard. It's hard to move. Uh, you can move it by changing pressure from high to low and high to low. Yeah. And you've got to put boosters. It's why we, we make it liquid, but LNG is not the answer, but you can do it. And so I'm waiting. Are you, we have always succeeded as you know, this collective grouping of people that we are, because at some point we get it, you know, and, the, and there's a collective spirit to do smart things. And the next smart thing for the world to do is, is to, is to hook the U S onto the European continent. Anyway, too much time on that. Yeah, uh, absolutely. So that, so that, so that Europe isn't just some peninsula on the, yeah. on the Asian continent, right? It, it, well, that's, I, um, that's, that's sort of Europe that's is the a, unfortunate problem, isn't it? Is that there's, they're sort of stuck there and, and they're dependent on Russia for gas. I mean, it, Im yeah. imagine, Im imagine where the North American continent would be if, um, if it was paying four or five X, four or five X, like you know, 20 X, the, the prevailing price of that gas on the continent of America. Well, I mean, that's, that's the, that's the burden that and like some stupid, like political stuff, but you know, that's the burden that, that, uh, yeah. that Europe has. Now in terms of dictators, the other big one, um, is, is China, of course, and the, and the biggest problem in the world, biggest problem in the world 
is the China Yuan Cross. Um, the Chinese manage a, a dirty peg. So really what I transpire, um, and again, I just, I'm, I'm urging people to think, so let's think of this. I want to say to you, um, we've had three systems of contractually managing sovereign relationships with regard to trade. The first being gold, uh, where gold would physically ship to, to reflect trade flows, um, which would have a, which was effectively high money, a high powered money. And so you were effectively creating credit cycles of boom and bust. Um, it failed in a spectacular manner, um, owing to a lack of price rigidity. Um, you, the UK was the first to renege and it had to devalue. Yeah. It was replaced by Bretton Woods. Um, and then what people don't realize, and, and again, Bre Bretton Woods was kind of dollar gold, like, except, except the, the, the overseer, the global overseer's currency, but quid pro quo, um, you know, we will pay it back to you in gold on demand. What people less recognize is that that was assert by the euro dollar market roughly 1965, but officially recognized with the closure of the gold window by Nixon in 71, late 71. Um, and, and then I want to say to you that, so since then the world has been governed by a kind of matrix of a dark web of this, um, of private sector determined credit flows, which have influenced the rise and fall of nations. Uh, but I want to say to you that system collapsed in 2008. We, 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 we more than briefly mentioned what was happening in 2008, but you know, we're all aware of the, the, the social censorship that's come with the Asian body invasion, you know, how you can be s switched off on Twitter, et cetera. Yep. Something similar has played out in terms of that word depression. You just, you don't, you don't read it. And yet I want to say to you that whilst GDP is globally and, and in America and elsewhere is, is higher than the levels obtained in 2008, and we are about globally, we're about $30 trillion short because we've not been able to, to regain the trend, the projection of prosperity that we had before. Now that is a depression, but you're forbidden from using that term. So we have a creeping depression because there has been a, a global failure in that third regime to manage and regulate the affairs of sovereign, sovereign nations. Now, the curse that we have just now is that China, the, the renminbi, I believe should be trading like close to four versus the dollar right. today, it's 6.3, 6.4. Um, and, and it's denied that by, uh, explicit policies, um, by the, the Chinese that robs the China's, the Chinese citizen of wealth, of, of income, you know, it makes overseas products more expensive. That creates the glut of savings, right? That, that is, that is spreading misfortune across the world. If you want to regain the trend rate of growth and prosperity that we had pre 2008, you've got to do something with the mercantilist problem. You've You've got to abolish a dirty peg. Now, I think the Chinese are, ha are well on the way to achieving that because they've made a spectacular mistake. You know, they, yeah. they have allowed a domestic credit bubble to propel the value of their property to an absurd level. Yeah. And absurdity is just a word, but when it reaches four times GDP, there are very few instances of that happening. But we know what happens and it's not good. You know, the last time was Tokyo in the 1980s. Um, right. So just now there's a comfort that the, 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 the bureaucrats have got this. I mean, that's just the conceit of every generation that comes next. You know, that um, long bull markets bestow 
false wisdom on regulators. And, and that will be shown to be wrong. Um, and actually, I think in this world, you know, as we look at prices falling all over us this year, um, and I, I talked about the horrors of contango with natural gas, and I refer to volatility. You can, you can never buy spot volatility. You always have to, to buy forward and bull is always expensive. I want to buy a um, dollar remimbi uh, volatility. Um, the, the realized is, has been very low. And so the applied has been pulled down to like four oh. or something. And, and so being kind of at the money one year forward, uh, strikes either calls or puts just feels like a good, a good thing. I would actually, uh, I think that the remimbi will weak. I don't think it should weaken. And, and I fear that the final turning point will be caused again by anarchy. The world is full of anarchy, you know, again, banning big oils, anarchy and it's, it's destructive. And I think the Chinese. And this is ironic, but I think the Chinese may take the same path. If the, if the property market really creates a savage credit contraction, I think the Chinese will choose uh, to devalue the renminbi, which is preposterous because they don't have over substantial overseas debts. Uh, they're already super competitive. So in choosing to devalue, it would be kind of like, if I'm going down, I'm, I'm taking all of you, <laughs> Boom, you're, you're all coming with yeah. me. And that's what I think will ultimately prove to be the catalyst for heads of state getting together and say, hmm, we need a new system, a new system to, to regulate how we engage with each other. Um, so that's yeah, going to I mean, if the, if the, uh, Chinese, uh, domestically get become and they're getting increasingly unhappy with with uh, with Xi. They may even choose to discontinue his leadership, right? I hope so, but um, yeah, I, I doubt it. You know, is that, is that a possibility? There's that remote when you're staring down the barrel of a gun. Uh, that yeah. that only it it only I mean it's he's more vulnerable. He's, he is more vulnerable. You know, he he's been in power for I want to say eight years. Uh, and so the error that he made was eight years ago, it was his predecessor, but he had the opportunity to come in and blame the predecessor and, and take pain. And now he would be, yeah, now even I would support him for like his lifetime shot at, at being, you know, dictator for life. Um, I am a time investor. I am not a value investor. I'm not a growth investor. I'm not a pharmaceutical investor. I'm not whatever. I'm a time investor. I launched China blow up fund about 12 years ago. Um, I was wrong, but I had a fund. So I ran it for two years. Okay. I returned two thirds of the capital. I chose to return. I chose to close it. I could have yeah. ran it to zero. I chose to return two thirds of the capital. If I had, if I had succeeded, I would have made 10 X. I'd have made a billion dollars. It didn't happen. China did not have an economic reversal. Why? Because, and again, what is an economic reversal? An economic, an economic reversal was accepting that long-term GDP, GDP, like growth, but not at the expense of wealth. Like, so you, could, you can generate yeah. GDP, but at the expense of wealth. Uh, would mean accepting kind of like maybe three, 4% GDP rates all as opposed to seven, eight. And, and they, they, they were unwilling. And so implicitly they allowed the credit genie to create the cult of property ownership. And that's where they are. Now, I, I did not know. Well, you, 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 sorry to interrupt you, but you, you did such a great job of, of going around. I mean, I, I remember your, your visit to China, your visits where, where, you know, you were showing building after building office complexes, high rise, you know, skyscrapers that were empty. And I think that was in Wuhan, right? Yeah. I, One I, of the places. I, yeah. I discovered the joys or otherwise of the, the wet mark. I mean, I, I, I remember <laughs> being horrified by what was going yeah. on there. And I 
I traveled, I flew into Hong Kong. I walked over the border uh, and I traveled on small trains and in the, you know, I had a, a sleeping car, a shared sleeping carriage. Um, and in the morning you'd step over people in the corridor and they've, they've got a, they've got a hot brew. You know, they're brewing up for, for breakfast. God, you know, they're different. It's a different culture. And, you know, <laughs> eating the heads off of lizards. I tell you, I had a killed for a cappuccino. Killed for a cappuccino. <laughs> but, uh, so, I, yeah, so I was there. Yeah. Uh, I, but I, what I did not know was that the Chinese horoscope, it has the same 12 characters as we have, but the, the pursuit of heavenly travel a, across the, the universe, it takes 12 years and not one year. Our system is one year as the revolution of the earth around the sun. Uh, I don't understand that medieval or otherwise system, but the Chinese measure time using the units of 12 years. So I want to say to you that the yeah. logic that I was pursuing 12 years ago was bang on. But today, not only is it bang on, but it is, you know, like, don't tell me how to make money. Tell me when. Now, now is the time. So China, again, yep. I think those, the vol embedded in the FX option market and being long Chinese sovereign bond funds, hard to find at the retail level, but kind of, they should be there. And, and of course you could take it if you're an institutional fund, uh, they are trending prices, su supporting and, and legitimizing everything I'm saying. The Chinese will be cutting and cutting and cutting interest rates, I believe. So, um, so that's, and then yeah. again, probably that's <clears throat> why treasuries could have the absurdity of making new price highs in the face of, uh, unmistakable evidence of inflation. And I, and I did promise I would try and have a go at saying, where's the source of inflation? Cause it's not today. Yeah. Today is, you know, we, we, clo we, clo I mean, let, let, we closed. That's what I was going to, you, you know, it's funny. I, I was going to ask you, is it, are we inflationary or are we inflation? So now you're, you're actually answering the question I already had yeah, well, planned to ask you. But, because that, yeah. that is the distinct, in, in, inflation is when, is when people, is when people can spend more money, the same or more money on both discretionary and non-discretionary items. And this is why Friedman was saying it's a monetary phenomenon because if the price of all items is accelerating, then you need more money to accommodate that. And if you don't, then what happens is the more that you spend on discretionary items means you have less to, to, to spend on a meal or, you know, a trip to the Caribbean or an upgrade in your car or whatever. And, and so it's still feels like a redux of that. Uh, the hardest thing just now that it's almost impossible just now to prove that we're not groundhogging the 2009, 2011 experience in the commodity complex and the, the boy who cried wolf, the inflation wolf. I will say yeah. that the one difference is energy and social mood. And I, and I, this is why I've, I've spoken too long about Europe and natural gas, but that's where it, I, that's where I see a thread an inflationary thread getting into the system because at the energy price levels pertaining to Europe today, governments are having to come in and subsidize and pay energy bills. And if those energy prices are going to continue to escalate, which I think they will, owing to the anarchy of how society wishes to regulate the exploration of resources, 
then governments are increasingly going to be subsidizing household bills. And that begins to sound like helicopter money where the, the, the subsidy check gets bigger. Yeah. So the U S had in the midst of COVID, uh, Trump and, and Biden, they, they had, what did we call them? We called them those checks to, to everyone, you know, Hey, it's on, it's on uncle Sal. Yeah. Go, go and spend no. again, necessary, but pandemic protection, pandem yeah. but yeah, we but now it's uh universal and <laughs> now it's a universal income, right? Universal basic income. Well, it's called save well, they're your, toying with it, but it's called save your ass, yeah. <laughs> but the pressure to yeah. save your ass is intense in Europe just now, you know, if, if the, the U S is just a port, a safe Harbor in a world that's gone bonkers. I mean, the world outside the American continent is, is fear is, is fearful, but, um, that I think that, that, that could burrow its way into the system, um, whereby that government implicit, implicit government subsidy will allow you to spend more on discretionary, non-discretionary, but presently, presently, um, that's a big ask that, it, you know, like you said, it, that's a spec, that's a speculation. It's a big ask. Um, and, 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 and mostly what we're seeing is we closed every factory in the world for 18 months. And then we sent a check to every household in the, the world's most prosperous nation. Say, hey, go buy things. At the same time <laughs> that the service economy, which is two thirds of the economy, was closed. So we gave everyone happy money. And, we, and, and then we said, go buy things. And they could go to restaurants and whatever, and they couldn't leave their house. So they went on Amazon. And the guy it, with the factory's like, I don't just turn the lights off. You know, I've got to configure this thing. <laughs> and so, yeah. <laughs> and prices have come in. They've said, well, you know, there's a there's a log jam, give me 18 months, but I'm going to have to ration demand. So prices here, that feels like where we are, but the oil thing, yeah. I lied. You, I, I wrote a paper. If you visit my website, hughhendry.com, it'll pop up and it'll offer you a free paper at the dawn of chaos. And, and I was claiming that not only is inflation a monetary phenomenon, but it's a psychological phenomenon. It, it requires a kind of. It requires anarchy and it requires break breakdown. And again, remember we were talking about the seventies and we, we said it was, yeah. it was the sex pistols. It was, you know, it was anarchy. It was inflationary. Um, I've been trying to dispel the, the link with Weimar. I, I think Weimar linkages, linkages are cheap and lazy because they ignore, um, there's no precedent of a modern liberal democracy generating high rates of inflation. Does, it doesn't happen. Why does it not happen? Because of the, the, the sheer magnitude of public debt markets here. So Weimar, that didn't yeah. happen. But if you want to make a comparison, the most valid Weimar comparison is that after the war, it was a profoundly divided society. It was a society that turned in on itself and, and tragically, um, there was a, a pop populist populist is a, is a loaded term these days. There was a unifying politician that could have brought them together and he was assassinated. And that's what, that was the ascent into chaos. And, and that's my biggest fear. When I look at the U S today, when I, when I, when I look at Canada today and, and I see these divisions where citizens turn, what I hate you and you hate me. Yeah. Um, that's ultimately, that's a, <clears throat> that's a contractual form of inflation. That anarchy will result in, um, in a, in a price response. I just hope to God we don't get assassinations. Yeah. I, I don't know if you saw it, but Darius Dale from 42 macro had a really great chart which uh, which showed how the U.S. in terms of its uh, wealth inequality was placed uh, among emerging markets in terms of its measures. 
And so in one chart, you get, you get a sense of, you know, what, what's the outcome of this K-shaped recovery that we had following the pandemic yeah. shutdowns where, where, you know, one class, one, one cohort of society got wealthier and busier and, 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 uh, you know, more pr uh, prosperous, uh, which we all know has happened. Yeah. And then the other cohort, which is the, the other 50, 60, 70% of the population are worse off. I want to challenge Much worse off. Yeah, I want to challenge your use of prosperous. Uh, one section of society, I think, got richer. Yeah. Uh, richer is yeah. when the assets that you own revalue higher. Pro prosperous means that um, you were rewarded for a risk undertaking for an endeavor and it paid off. Uh, I'll take it. Yeah. I'll, I'll take it. Yeah. <laughs> and, that, and again, that's, that's the, the malign yeah. function in, in society. Yeah. That's the malign underbelly of quantitative easing. Is, is that's that. the division though, isn't it? It's the division. But, you know, statistics, damn statistics, you know, lie statistics. US has always featured poorly, I, I want to say, those, those Gini coefficient tables. And yet, um, you, you travel around the world and the only line outside an embassy seeking a visa is the US embassy, you know. Uh, and, you know, uh, the, the most enthusiastic people for Trump were, were the Mexican immigrants. I mean, you know, they want to, <laughs> yeah. they want to hose down on, on the, you know, this is a country where you can become prosperous, you know, uh, that doesn't pertain to the rest of the world. No flaws and all flaws. But the, all the, I guess I was just trying to make a point about how the, the inequality is leading to like what's happening in Ottawa here with the trucks the uh you know the, the the convoy and and what's happening in other parts of the world uh, in Europe you know i mean i mean when something goes wrong in europe socially they they take to the streets yeah, right yeah, i mean yeah. well but the paris being yes oh i mean i, I lived in paris heavens yeah. i i moved to paris august 2018 which was 3 months before the emergence of the gilets jaunes demonstration, which again, shows you how hard it is to solve yeah. for the, the climate because the French, their diesel levy was way below European average. And so with the Paris Accord, they agreed that they would clearly, they would seek to rectify that anomaly. Um, but the folk without stock market gains, the folk that live in rented accommodation, the folk that live in the countryside and use their car a lot. That excise tax meant the difference between spending on, on something that they, they valued and, and not hard. But, and I found myself, I, I lived in a, in a fancy part of town, the Avenue Osh by the Arc de Triomphe mm -hmm. and the uh, Parc Monceau. Um, and now I, I know what tear gas smells like, you know, I could, I could smell <laughs> vape bomb in the morning, baby, you know. Saturday yeah. mornings where <laughs> I had tanks, I had a tank, I had a water can and whatever, but <clears throat> France, wow. I mean, you know, um, but smells like victory, <laughs> uh, the, <laughs> but something, something, something grave, something truly grave did happen as a function of the Ottawa demonstrations, you know, the, uh, the using finance as, as a weapon against those folk. Uh, and, and without a uh, due process uh, and invoking emergency measures, um, I, I feel like we just mute a community, a part of our community. You know, we, we just, we, 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 we inflicted a profound human role on members of our society. And when it, the genie's out of the bottle, you know, once it's, once it's happened, it's going to happen again. It's like, it's bad. Um, so let's try and make, make the world better. Um, is crypto the answer? <laughs> um, <laughs> okay, what, okay, what, can, what, what can you say? All I can say is nothing. Uh, I, all I, 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 I have an opinion on most things. I speak too much. I feel like I, I know I'm prejudicial on where prices should be. Um, I have no idea where, let's call it Bitcoin. I, Bitcoin trades at around about 40,000 today. I have no idea where it should or where it could trade. To my mind, it, it, it has, it has very 
uh, it's very even wide. It could trade at 10,000. It could trade a hundred thousand. So the, the allocation I want to make to those wides, it's, it's nothing, frankly, it's nothing. But, um, again, <coughs> if we are to try and find a let's again, be constructive rather than talk about, uh, nuking parts of our community, um, the NFT thing intrigues me and I'm, I'm working on launching an NFT because I am the prophet of absurdity. So I feel like I should be there, <laughs> uh, but also I want to be there because there are literally millions of smart, young, creative people, and they are just, they're devoting their lives to this thing. And, Ignore that at your peril, you know, so, but yeah. what I like about what I'm drawn to it is this notion that you could create an asset for other people. So yeah, I think I'm, I'm still a bit of a secret. I think I'm going to be, I think I'm going to be a superstar in the next three years. Uh, yeah, I've got 9,000 followers on, on YouTube. Why, why can't that be a million? You know, my book's a success. I start getting TV gigs. I'm on Joe Rogan. Boo, I've got a million. Right. So imagine I, imagine I launch an NFT today and, and basically it's a club and it's my club. I, I'm offering proximity to me via a digital contract. Proxi if I, and I'm playing with words, if I become a superstar, right? Then proximity to me, that market is a boot market. And, and, and the people who are, who get me now, the pioneers, they get me. So that's like property ownership. And, and, and it's not just me. Any kid in the world has that convex opportunity. You know, anyone could be Mark Zuckerberg. And, and here's a means of actually doing it without needing Peter Thiel or whatever, you know, to, 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 to get right. you going. So that's interesting. And then I thought again. I could, we could, we could, again, if we were super smart and not anarchists on the planet, we could take that, we could take that crypto understanding. So what the, the greatest thing about crypto is that it demonstrated that if you want to encourage conversion, create a bull market, right? Make people money and, and you've got cult followers. Okay. They'll change their behavior. So what if we, what if. What if we measured your, a household's carbon footprint, typical carbon footprint, easy to measure, easy to measure, right? Um, and we, we went to Europe, which has a functioning market and we, and we, we said, okay, well, the price for emitting one ton of carbon presently is almost a hundred bucks. It's a hundred bucks. Okay. I said one person emits 13 barrels of not emits, but consumes 13 barrels, 13 times 60, 600 is 780. So it's almost a ton. Let's say the average household, I mean, what is the average household now? Let's, let's say it's three, somewhere between two and four. Yes. Um, and, and that's, so that's 3000. So, okay. Yep. Yeah, uh, the value of that pyramid is 300 bucks. Okay. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you 10 years worth of it. I'm going to give you 10 years. Cost me nothing. It's like quantitative easing. I'm going to give you a virtual yeah. voucher. I'm going to say, um, I'm going to say that this is the end of communism in Russia. Remember at the end of communism in Russia, they went round with tokens to all the households and they said, Hey, this certificate is ownership of Gazprom. Keep it. It's going to be worthwhile. And then unfortunately, you know, you know, the oligarchs sent guys around with bottles of, you know, vodka. Hey, I'll, I'll trade you this for the token. Yeah, They're like, for that. Oh yeah. Okay. So, you know, <laughs> um, so what I'm saying is virtually we could send, I'm sure I got the mask wrong. I think it's more than $300. Uh, you know, we could send like a couple of thousand dollars of environmental permits and we could say, Hey, listen. We're being very generous and we're giving you this asset. Okay. And you've got a choice. You've got, you own this thing, not us, you own this thing. Okay. If you, we're going to make them scarce. So we're going to be, 
you know, so each year you, you're going to need, let's say a hundred of these permits, right. To pay off your carbon emission. Um, we're only going to be giving you incrementally, we're only be going to be giving you 50 and then 20 and then 10, and then we're giving you none. Okay. So if you are responsible and you change your practices and your carbon, if you were your carbon, what, uh, your, uh, you know, it's like, it's like doing your tax return, your carbon return will be, will reflect that. And we will ask less and less of you to offer these vouchers, which means you, you will keep more and more of these vouchers. And these vouchers have value because they reflect the price of polluting the atmosphere. And that is only going one way. It's why you should own carbon permits in Europe. The price is only going yeah. one way. It's scarce and getting scarcer. Okay. So suddenly, cause the problem with quantitative easing is that it was the enrichment of the class of people fortunate to own assets. So the principal number one objective for governments today is how to put assets into the hands of those who don't have them. And what quantitative easing reveals is it's so easy, right? We can do it virtually. I can give you, I can digitally give you a wallet. It costs me nothing, right? And then you can enrich yourself by changing your behavior or not. I mean, it's, it's actually, it's just a progression from Thatcherism in the 1980s. So I, yeah, that, well, this is, this is all, this is what, this is already starting to happen in, in real, right? I mean, we're starting to see a uh, sort of democratization of, of carbon credit ownership, right? There's all, there's already a number of new vehicles that are allowing investors to get into the carbon credit market. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I have an ambition to, 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 to launch one of them because, uh, we need more public participation and knowledge of these schemes yep. so that people will reject chaining themselves to fences and insisting on the abolition of exploration. Um, and we need public knowledge to push back because at some point the price is way, way cheap, but then it's going to become cheap and then it's going to become a little bit cheap and then it's going to become kind of not really that cheap, really. Um, and, uh, so in Europe. The power generators have got it and they've changed, changed their behavior. They've been punished by it, but the corporates, the industrialists have not, you know, BASF yep. saying, Hey, look, the price would have to go up another 30, 50% before we even recognize it, which is, you know, be careful what you ask for kind of thing. Cause boom, you know, but, um, but when it gets to that level, you know what they're going to do? They're going to let lobby like hell. Uh, to make changes. And when they come to lobby, we need a $50 billion fund. Like if Kathy Wood and the absurdity of art can have 60, 60 yards in, in that, you know, preposterous fund, like doing speculating just for the, the art of speculating. What, imagine we had 60 yards and we speculated to save the planet and we had 60 billion eyeballs saying, don't you dare listen to these corporate guys. Or we're going to boot you out, you know, and that's where it requires the democratization and it needs kind of crazy people like me rather than gray guys and suits to kind of get that mess. I got to, I got to <laughs> team up with Leonardo DiCaprio if you're watching Leo, um, and, uh, and put it together, <laughs> you know, but dream on. Well, it gives a whole new, I think what you're suggesting, Hugh, it gives a whole new meaning to impact investing. Yeah. But boy, we, right? you know, we, we got to stop being passive. Um. You know, one of the, I was the only person fighting back. I mean, not the only person, but you know, is one of the more vocal, um, the, again, I said to you, 2008, the politicians, I was such a, a shock that the scale, the magnitude of the, the tsunami, the events are, it was bigger than them. And they're like, and so they, they did that politician thing. It's like, let's find a scapegoat. Hey, hedge fund, secretive, rich. Ooh, perfect. And then hedge funds were like, <laughs> just not taking the bait. And if you, if you allow the politician to stigmatize you, then you have no role in society. So we can sit there, just say, and there's a bit of that, Hey, this is, this is a hypocrisy for me because I am in St. Bart's paying no tax in a, in a perfect community with no crime and no public debt and eternal sunshine. So. For the most part, people should just say, 
screw you, you know? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well there you have it a good way to end screw yeah. you Andrew <laughs> <laughs> well, 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 wow you, you took a, we took a, we took a great deal of your time but it was very informative um yeah yeah Hugh I'm I'm uh I'm blown away I'm looking forward already to the next time we get to uh chat this was very exciting. Yes. It was very exciting to talk to you today. Well, like, so I, I'm on here because you guys have done such an exceptional job in building this franchise. So my congratulations to you for that, because it's not easy. Um, but I'm, I'm here well, to address your franchise. I've, I've had five years like Rocky. I, I've been getting into condition and I'm ready to take on everyone. <laughs> I'm not only ready to make money, I'm ready to, to try and positively nudge society. I cannot do it alone. I need everyone watching this. If any, if any, if, if anything yeah. resonates, right, reach out to me. I'm sure you'll be putting up my, my details, you know, reach out to me because I can't do it yep. alone, but I, I want, you know, I had disengaged and, <clears throat> and I think you can tell I'm now engaging with the world and seeing it like mm -hmm. my, my, you know, I'm switched on. I'm lit up. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I, I, I think we echo the sentiment that that you know we, we, we share the same, the same or similar agenda to you in terms of you know wanting to affect change and and wanting to inform, and and educate, and um, you know I, I I'll add that you know I, I for one you know we were we were, <laughs> we were quite saddened when you decided to become a pirate. <laughs> you know? Well, remember, I, um, I was always a pirate. I was persuaded to join the Royal Navy yeah. to grow my AUM, which, which I did. I went from yeah. like 50 million to one and a half billion. And I ended up taking antidepressants <laughs> because the, the, the quid pro quo was yeah. we'll give you 1.5 billion. If, if you get rid of that, that crazy guy, I, I was the man in the mask for like three years. Yeah. No, I'm a, um, yeah. so I, I, I was always born a pirate, but you're right. I, I, you hear this between 2017 and, and 2020, I had disengaged March, 2020, a little light bulb went on. Um, it was like the return of the, the last Jedi. I, you know, I'm on that, that rock outcrop in the middle of nowhere, but with my lightsaber, I've been getting into training and, and I'm ready to come back. Did you ever, uh, did you ever relate to. Uh, Ragnar Danishold. Don't, don't, <laughs> don't get me started. Um, uh, I, um, what? the, in December, I, I, then, you know, you need at least one month, like probably two months. Uh, I reread and Rand, and it's a little bit like mm -hmm. the, my seed investor seeded, uh, Soros and, and one of it, his reservation with me was that I was too young, you know, Soros was 40 when he launched quantum and he was saying that uh, you, there's something about being a risk taker that you need the tenure of manhood. You've got to have lived a life. And he looked to me as a 32 year old, which was the age when the Amaranth kid blew up. So he was quite right. Right. Uh, and he looked at me and said, gee, you're, you're, you're younger than I prefer. Um, and. And, and so I, I got to say, I read the genius of, of Ayn Rand, you know, as a curious late teenager, but you've got to go back and you've, you've got to read it again uh, as a, as Absolutely. a man, as a, you know, as a, as a, as a person who spent yes. time being a citizen of this earth and especially having experienced the last two years, you have to read it again. So my, my, my Twitter is my Twitter and my Instagram are dedicated to uh, ripping off Anne Rand <laughs> and pretending that it's my wisdom. <laughs> so relevant. Yeah. I just, I, I always remember the, uh, the spot where Ragnar meets up with Hank Reardon in the road. Yeah. Yeah. And, and gives him the bar of gold as a uh, repayment for, for all of his pain. <laughs> it's such a, such a, uh, you know, 
influential story, but, uh, you know, certainly try to read it once a decade. And Hank throws again, it down. He's like, get again. out of here. I don't, I don't, yeah, I don't need, right. I don't need your charity. Um, <laughs> Hank gets it eventually. Uh, hey, yeah. say boss is my goals glitch. Is it glitch? G yeah. Goals, whatever it's called. Goals glitch. Gulch, gulch. Gulch, gulch. Gulch, gulch. Gulch, gulch. gulch. gulch, gulch. Yeah. gulch. This is my goals glitch. This, this, um, you know, I, I, I literally, I talk, I, I, I said to you, my hypocrisy, I have withdrawn. I saw early that yeah. this was a, a society intent on destroying itself. And, and I've chosen to withdraw from that process, but virtually and using these portals, I'm willing to kind of be a kind of a beacon of try and attempt to be a beacon and, 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 and be the, the Ragnar and, and try and take down some of those, some of those corpulent, uh, vessels that they can only do is more and more harm. But again, I it's a it. campaign I and, and I, um, I keep making clay. I, I, I listen to myself. I, you know, I'm a narcissist, you know, if, you know, the, 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 the major critique of any single girl about a guy is the only one to talk about themselves. So, I mean, you know, guilty as charged. Um, <laughs> but I hear myself and I'm making lots of bold intentions, but I can't do it without other people. People got to reach out to. Well, neither can we. And, and, uh, we hope to do this much more with you. Right. Yeah. Well, I've enjoyed it. I've got to go and edit my loony podcast uh try and make sense of that <laughs> i've now got to listen to myself for the next three hours so anyway um <laughs> that's painful isn't it <laughs> well this, this was supposed to be a 30 minute show and we went to 90 minutes but you know what you this is great insight yeah. and we are looking forward to sharing this with our audience uh we're going to share your message thank you very much gents thank you